אורחים נכבדים, תודה רבה שבאתם לאירוע הראשון של מוניטור האקדמיה הישראלית. בשנים הבאות, בתאריך דומה, אנחנו מתכננים לערוך אירועים בנושאים בוערים באקדמיה. אני דנה בונט, מנכ"לית מוניטור האקדמיה הישראלית ועורכת האתר האינטרנט. כמו כן, דוקטורנטית בקינגס קולג' לאדן, והמחקר שלי עוסק בפוסט ציונות באקדמיה. דבר ראשון, ברצוני להודות לתומכים שלנו, כגון ברנר בלאזרוס ואחרים, שמאמינים שתפקידה של המערכת להשכלה גבוהה הוא לשרת את החברה הישראלית, ושתפקיד המוניטור הוא לידע את ציבור משלמי המיסים וחבר הנאמנים של האוניברסיטאות, מה נעשה בכספם. ברצוני להודות למי שפנו אלינו, לחברים וחברי הנאמנים של האוניברסיטאות, ששיתפו אותנו, והביעו בפנינו את דעתיהם. מוניטור האקדמיה הישראלית החל להפעיל את אתר האינטרנט בשנת 2004. כיום נכנסים לאתר כמיליון מבקרים בשבוע. בהתחלה רק אספנו עדויות מהאינטרנט לגבי פעילות ומאמרים של אנשי אקדמיה ישראלים שפועלים נגד ישראל. מעטים בארץ יודעים שבין האדריכלים של תנועת החרם העולמית נגד ישראל היו מרצים מכמה אוניברסיטאות ישראליות. למרות שהכנסת חוקקה חוק נגד קריאה לחרם, חלקים עדיין ממשיכים. בשנים האחרונות הוספנו מאמרי מערכת אקדמיים שמפרטים את פעילותם של תומכי הגישה הניאו-מרקסיסטית הביקורתית, שלא מאפשרת במה לגישות שונות במדעי הרוח והחברה, ושאנשיה מנסים להרחיב את השליטה בפקולטות הללו. התהליך הזה הביא לכך שבכמה אוניברסיטאות יש עכשיו קבוצות גדולות של חוקרים מהאסכולה הרדיקלית. ההוכחה הכי טובה לכך היא שיש גידול ניכר בבעלי תואר שלישי בתחומים הללו. השיטה של חבר ומי חבר עובד. משום שעניינים פנים אקדמיים אינם חשופים בפני הציבור, חשוב לנו לספק מידע לציבור לגבי בעיות מהותיות שקיימות במדעי הרוח והחברה, באופן של העלאת בעיות לצורך שיפור. אנחנו גם התחלנו לערוך מחקרים אקדמיים מקוריים ומפרסמים אותם, והבוקר תשמעו על המחקר הראשון שלנו. אני מבקשת להעביר בקהל דף ועט שבו אנשים ירשמו את שאלותיהם כדי שנחסוך בזמן אחר כך. כמו כן, שימו לב שהשולחן העגול שלנו מוקלט ויועלה לאינטרנט. נתחיל בדוברת הראשונה. פרופסור אופיר צדיקה. אקדמיק פרידום אין ישראל, a comparative perspective, will discuss academic freedom in Israel and compare it to freedom enjoyed by faculty in three countries that are considered academic leaders in the world, Germany, Great Britain, and the United States. This is a first-of-its-kind research project. It was commissioned by Israel Academia Monitor to address frequently heard charges that Israeli scholars suffer serious restrictions of their freedom. Ophira Selictar is a professor of political science uh, in Bratz College, Pennsylvania. She was previously scholar in residence at the Middle East Research Institute at the University of Pennsylvania. She has also worked as a consultant to agencies in the United States. Sessica is the author of eight books and dozens of articles and journals, chapters, and books at schools of reports on Middle East issues and Israel. In 2005, she published annual drug laws from post Zionism to political activism that analyzed the abuse of academic freedom by radical scholars. Thank you. 
that are of the staff is the paradigm. And who obviously is charging in charge of producing the paradigms? We, the scholars. Then you have the applied work, then you have the popular work, then you have the conspiracy theory. But paradigms are very, very powerful. If we want to think outside the paradigm, we always said to think outside the box. I have some bad news for all those who believe that we're doing about it outside. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, is there any problem? I have some bad news for those who think that you can think outside the paradigm. Paradigms are extremely important and so binding. There is a story told by Henry Hopkins, who was an aide to President Roosevelt. In the first and last meeting between the President and King Abdul Aziz in the South, in Saudi Arabia, uh, Roosevelt said to King Saud, he said, Your Majesty, if you support the creation of State of Israel, we would help you, we would give you aid. We would make your desert rule. And the old king, the majestic king of the desert, turned uh, to him and said, Don't you think, Mr. President, that there is a place for deserts in this world? That's the strength of the paradigm. No one can think outside the paradigm. The fact that the, the Iranian revolution was not predicted in 1979 it has to do with lots of factors, but the single most important thing is the paradigm. That there was never in the history of mankind a regressive revolution. All the revolutions were progressive. And that's why President Jimmy Carter and his cabinet, that's why the CIA, the DIA, every single intelligence in town in Washington. In America, when I say town, that's Washington. Believe, believe that this would be a progressive revolution. So paradigms are extremely important. Now, and that's where the problems come. Because in the contemporary liberal arts, humanities and, <coughs> and social sciences, there are two competing paradigms. There is the positive, positivist paradigm, something that we all learned, which means that truth can be achieved, social truth can be achieved with discourse and pedagogical measures and fixed rules, and you have to be objective and neutral. And the classroom becomes the marketplace of ideas. Marketplace of ideas. Now, in and so that's what we all used to say. But the new paradigm is a neuro Marxist paradigm, critical paradigm. It says there's no, there's no social truth. There are only narratives. And essentially, your narrative is as good as my narrative. And what do critical scholars do? They expose the quote-unquote hegemonic narrative and the dominant classes, and they impose other narratives on it. Now, the man who is responsible for bringing this neo-Marxist critical paradigm to Middle East studies and that's why we have the state of affairs as we have is, of course, Edward Said. This I call the faithful marriage. Said knew Foucault. Said knew all the French critical texts. And the, and the truth of this marriage is his book, Orientalism. The single most published and read book in academic history. If you look at how many hits Saeed has on Google, as opposed to any other person, you would see that, that that's true. So, that brought us to the state that we are in. Israel, in the positivist paradigm, is a state like other states. Jews are an authentic and religious community. They have a working liberal side democracy, ranked very highly by Freedom House, which is the one that beats the rankings. And in the distributive justices, then it's a market economy, and everyone knows when passes, if you work from the positivist paradigm. However, if you look at the critical paradigm, you would see that Jews are a inventive people, 
there is a professor at Tel Aviv University, paid by the taxpayers of Israel, who even wrote two books to that effect, right? Now, the Israeli democracy is not a democracy, it's a heron-log democracy, which means it's an apartheid state, which is based on South Africa. There's quite a few professors at the other university that made their careers using this paradigm and making this. And then there's a distributive justice system. It's a capitalist system that exploits workers, and it's European women, Palestinians, you name it. Now, my question to myself first, and to all of us, became, how is it that this particular paradigm became so <coughs> entrenched in Israeli universities? That's a key question that we have to ask. And the reasons are so many, and to me, very interesting. First of all, there's a huge market for scholarship and scholars who partake in this anti-Israel sack. I calculated roughly that it's six to seven times easier to publish something that is critical of Israel, that is written from that paradigm, than from other the other paradigm. Why? Because there's a lot of money there. There's a lot of journals there. There's a lot of presses there. So, publication is the name of the game in academia, and that's what it comes. So, and another thing that I empirically uh, analyze, people who come from the critical neo marxist perspective end up doing their sabbaticals in Ivy League schools in America and top universities in England because that's where that paradigm flourishes. People with very good records who are not critical scholars, well, they go to what we call second or third tier. I don't want to mention names, but I know a very distinguished sociologist of this country never managed to get any better than, uh, well, maybe I should say, those universities, and he wouldn't be at that Sorry. But it wasn't an Ivy League school. <laughs> So, then I looked at why is it that in Israel there is so much of this thing, apart from what I just said about the opportunities for publishing. <coughs> and I figured out, it took me some time to figure it out, and that's essentially the fruit of that particular uh, research, that, uh, that report, that there is an inverse correlation between uh, between, um, between the amount of freedom and how Israel is perceived in, from, the perspective, from the perspective of a critical paradigm. Let me explain that. And this is something that I want to address, not just to this audience. I would like everyone in this country to understand that there is no such thing as an abstract academic freedom and there is no such thing as a uniform standard academic freedom. Every country has its own history and its own uh, path to how they got to where they are. And I managed to do that. I hope that I can convey that. You see, there's a cultural history. Where do we come from? There's case law, there's government intervention, there's transition to management economy, which I am going to explain. And I use three countries to make very clear how Israel stands as opposed to other <coughs> leaders in uh, social sciences. I'm not talking about hard sciences. Now, and I gave them a index number. In Germany, the index of freedom is about five out of a ten. Why? First of all, because of their Nazi past, they needed to have to be re-educated in democratic procedures. But that also meant that there is a very strong constitutional court, which was imposed on them by the Allies, that has the right and has done so on many occasions to judge whether a book is academic or it is just propaganda. That's very, very important. There's a lot of cases. Now, and then there is the third thing, the, what we call management university. At a certain point of time, countries that have run out of money for their public schools. And they said essentially to them, you have to manage on your own. And management means that you have to introduce business practices. I think we're going to hear from one of our 
speakers later on about business and corporate management practices. And that's what happened in Germany. So, as a result, they spoke of academics to do things outside what they're asked to do is very, very limited. Because everyone is counting the pennies, everyone's pinching pennies as a matter of fact. So this is Germany. Now we have the United Kingdom. Here, they, I would say the index is six. First of all, because of Mrs. Thatcher, that and Mrs. Thatcher who died three weeks ago or something like this. The first thing she did, one of the first things she did, she abolished tenure. Because she understood, she understood something that very few people, people in this country understand. Without tenure, people do not have the luxury and the, 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 the freedom to engage in whatever they want to engage. And there are very strict uh, evaluations. People are being evaluated on what they write, what they publish, how much they spend on their things. So that's very, that's the management university. She, she appointed, I mean, not she, but because of the report, the universities were asked to produce a 50 percent of academics versus business people on their boards. And as I said, we're going to hear about boards later on. Now, and so there is a considerable government intervention. Now, it's my favorite case, my own country. I am now making very clear that I am only talking about public universities. Private universities in America is, is something very different. If a public university, if a private university wants to teach that the earth is flat and the board agrees with it and, and the students want to pay the tuition, that's fine. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, religious universities and they teach whatever they teach. If a university wants to teach, it needs to the same to the same teacher. But that's not the university that the public money supports. So, but the most important thing is case law. Uh, the America, as you know, is a, is a highly litigious society. So if people are suing each other over cats and dogs and whatever, I mean, really, I, I don't want to be frivolous, and I know that I am being uh, uh, recorded here, but I would have told you about the story of my uh, poodle, sweet poodle Romy, that upset some of my pet neighbors when they decided they would sue me. But that's beside the point. It's a litigious country. So, um, case law makes up an important uh, group of, ma of factors that manage to limit uh, academic freedoms. Why? Because there are specific things that, that public uh, uh, professors in public universities, in state universities, cannot do. Now, government intervention is 10. Why? Because public schools, what we call state schools, the, the governor, the sitting governor of the state appoints the board of directors, mostly businessmen and politicians, the board of directors appoints the president, and the president serves at he or she serves at their uh, at their at their yeah right. Now the third thing that really damped damped freedom is the corporate university. The states are broke. Everyone knows that uh, the states are broke. They have no money for anything, and the and higher education is not such a great imperative for them because that's not where the goals are, obviously. So, essentially, the universities were told that they had to manage on their own, they had to raise. And one of the ways, and this is very interesting, one of the ways in which they manage is by eliminating uh, tenured positions, especially in the social sciences. According to the latest statistics, there is only about 30% of uh, tenured social science professors. And again, like with Mrs. Thatcher, you can imagine that a person who works on a contract or an adjunct part-time, the last thing on his mind is to go and, and agitate for whatever. Because he has a wife, he has children, he has a mortgage to pay, and that comes before everything else. Okay? Now, I'm not going to advocate the abolition of of tenure, but that's not a bad idea to keep people in talk. Now, as a result, and I am only 
going to talk about the Middle East. The Middle East and Israel in the Middle East became today the, 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 the litmus test of academic freedoms. All the battles that used to be over, whatever professors can say, that uh, African Americans have a lower IQ or a higher IQ or whatever IQ, that's, that's a set that's wrong. The, the battle over what is academic freedom is about what we can say in class of Israel. And you can see here that the European Union has instituted a very stringent measure saying that anti-Zionism is essentially a new, uh, a new form of anti-Semitism. Now that does not mean, and I want to be very, very clear, because I always get these questions from the audience of whatever, well, can we say anything but, uh, critical of Israel? By all means, this is not what it is all about. If anyone, and I challenge you to, I and mean, I invite you to go and, be, and look at the working definition, there are certain things that are considered, are considered in less than it, if you use them um, uh, with regard to Israel, not simple uh, garden variety critique of, of, uh, critique of the West Bank or whatever. Nazification of Israel is one of the most important things. Scholars throughout Europe, European Union, cannot compare Israel to a Nazi state because that is considered anti-Semitism. They can be sued if they have the generic to do that. Now, another one. And this is an amazing story of how the American system responds to, to, to uh, development. Uh, there was a man, probably some of you know him, he is now the uh, president of Shalem College, Martin Kramer. And in 2001, he was in the United States and he wrote a book about Ivory Towers of Zen, saying that the Programs, the Middle East programs do not teach the reality, they teach the Said version of reality. This was taken up by Congress. There was a hearing from Congress, and the Congress decreed that those who receive Title VI funding, this is federal funding for academic programs, cannot do, uh, have to provide a balanced view of the of the uh, of the area. They cannot teach the Saidian view of reality. This is Title kind VI. Of Otherwise, their Title VI money would be taken away. And this is being renewed by Congress every five years. So there is a huge response from the political system to this type of thing. Now let's look at Israel, my favorite example. And I will put it in blue. Israel, of all the countries that I uh, that I reviewed, has a very high level of academic freedom, and I would give it nine. Again, there is no one good factor that explains it. Remember my little wiggle: had cultural history, management, whatever. It started with the fact that the first. Uh, I'm not talking about the Technion, which is technically the first, but the first liberal art school was the Hebrew University, and it was built by Judah Magnus and a very strong contingent of anti-Zionists, Martin Buber, etc. Now, they all received funding for, from the American Council of Judaism which is, again, it's an anti-Zionist organization with very deep pockets. The uh, heirs to the Sears Rubber and Fortune were there, and the, the, the Garbergs were there, the Stonesburgers who run the New York Times and this very they take an anti-Zionist, anti-Israel. So he had the money and he could do what he wanted to do. And his vision, and I in this book, I quote some of these things, and it's amazing what he views himself. He says that we are the secular priests of the culture. We stand above the nation. We are not someone that is, uh, that is in any way beholden to the taxpayers. God. He didn't say, he said that. And he said, and there's, there's also um, some other evidence that they did not consider themselves to be a natural 
a national university. When the Mongolians said to me, look, this is a new country, we need trained people in certain disciplines that are applied disciplines, his response was, I'm sorry, we are not a technical college. We only do uh, basic research and basic theory and basic science. Leo Ross, one of the, uh, he was the head of the philosophy department. In 1946, when there was a general, I mean, there was a strike against the British, and the Yeshu wanted to pressure them to, uh, to, in, to get um, the refugees from the camps into the country, that the whole thing ended up in that famous exodus episode. So there was a thing. And Ross disobeyed the, the strike, and students knocked on his door. And they said, Professor Ross, why are you now striking? Why are you working? And he said to them, look, I know that my writings are more important than strikes, because my writings are the ones that move politics. Now, there, is name, there are names of, for this type of behavior, but since I'm being recorded, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> now, the second probably issue is, and this is probably the, the, the most important issue, and here is what we might do. The courts need to get involved. And at the moment, the courts and the legal community is a standoff. They just don't want to get involved. There is almost zero case law pertaining to this issue. So that's really a very important part. And the next thing, in 1997, when, Net when Netanyahu came to power for the first time, in the press, the Prime Minister. He appointed a committee headed by uh, retired Supreme uh, uh, Court Justice Maltz. That Maltz committee was a faint replica of what Mrs. Thatcher did in England. And even that met with ferocious and fierce resistance and the government could do nothing. To this very day, Key parts of the Maltz Committee recommendations are not being implemented, and I think we would hear that later on. And that should have been implemented, but they were not implemented, and I don't know when they would be implemented. So what do we have in terms of Middle East select examples? Because of the very broad scope of academic freedoms in this country, Israeli scholars can compare Israel to Nazi Germany. Not only do they can, but they do, and some of them, and one of them even got a street named after him. I'm referring to, I'm referring to Leibovitz. Uh, he, he, Professor Leibovitz got a street named after him. He was the first, he was the pioneer of Nazification of Germany. Of Israel. Of Israel. Sorry? Nazification of Israel. Nazification of Israel, I'm sorry. Nazification of Israel, he was the pioneer and he got the statement after him. Now, in spite of the Knesset law, Israeli scholars still call to boycott. Calling to boycott would not have been possible in the United States but because of case law. There was a case of 1978 that says you cannot call for action that would be detrimental to your institution and to the, uh, and to the educational uh, uh, community at large. Here they did and they still do some. Okay? And, and this is my very fa favorite. And I asked a number of leaders at the universities about it, and no one had a good uh, answer for that. This is my very favorite one. Activist, activist um, scholars are hired to teach certain fields. That's how it is. In a research university, as opposed to a college, you get hired to teach this or that or that. And you have to teach and research in this field. After they get tenure, they switch to the 
Arab-Israeli conflict. So we have whole fields that go unattended. I do not want to mention names, but I can tell you one thing. We are, and this is just a hint, we are missing uh, anything that has to do with sociology or organization. Because as it happened, the person who was hired to teach and research his, the uh, uh, sociology of organization is very busy writing about the Arab-Israeli conflict. And he's not the only one. And there was a lady who actually pioneered this, and I had a very, I had a very interesting exchange with her. She was a Hebrew University professor. She, her field of study was Soviet Union. And she became the spokesperson, spokeswoman for uh, Peace Now. So she stopped pr producing and researching on the Congress of the Union and Russia, but she started writing on the Arab-Israeli conflict. So what we are having here is something that is amazing. This would have not been tolerated in the hard sciences at all. If someone is uh, hired to teach and research, let's say, tissue engineering, He's not going to write about the Arab-Israeli conflict. He would be booted out. But in the social sciences, it is tolerated here. This is a disservice to students, and it is a disservice to the taxpayers. Anyway, now, what are the costs of that particular broad freedom? First of all, Israeli uh, liberal arts paint a very heavy price for that. Uh, my colleague here on the panel, Dr. Jacob Bergman, has done many studies which show that social sciences, as opposed to hard sciences and engineering, are trending well below the average globally. Because if everyone is writing about the Arab Israeli conflict and critical this and critical that, they are not published in the right in the right uh, uh, team, in the right field. There's just not enough impact. So Israel, which is very high on the index of hard sciences, is very low on the lows on the, in, the, on the, in the other sciences, right? Now, students are not well served by faculty that is using its classroom as a pra platform for political indoctrination, and rather than making it a marketplace of ideas, and we would hear from one of them and her experience in that particular uh, domain later. Now, taxpayers and society are not well served by faculty who abandon their field of research to engage in writings that support their political agenda. That should not happen, and that has never happened in the other countries. Because there are periodical evaluations, whether they are tenured or not, there are periodical evaluations. You have to show that you produce something, and especially if you are a contract. A professor or an adjunct professor, it makes it very hard. Okay? Now, I'm coming to a close. This is, an, this is also an external problem that no other country but Israel has. And this is the case of the PGU. Call an international, you, you probably all heard about the PGU when we're going to uh, uh, hear from the uh, governor of the board of PGU, so he would figure it. But this is actually unprecedented, in my opinion, in my knowledge, of in the annals of modern academy, that a university would appeal to an international community to protest a routine review of its department. And look at the response. We compiled, they not compiled 40, uh, a list of some 40 professional or associations. I'm not even talking about hundreds of individuals. We, there's about 40 uh, associations that wrote letters to the Gonsar and others, essentially saying, if you close this department, we will boycott you. And, you know, you may say that they were blinked or they didn't blink. The, the, the social network is full of gloating that they did break. The, how do they say that in Hebrew? They hit kapu. I love that. I love the term. I love the term. They gave in. They gave in. They gave in. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. 
they came they, 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 yeah they can start you so but you see this is unique what does it tell you that Israel as a country lost some of its sovereignty over its educational system that has never happened anywhere it's inconceivable for a president of a public university or any university in America to appeal to the international community to protest in front of the regional uh, councils for higher education. America is a good country, so we have many of them, not just one. It's inconceivable. So anyway, this is my concluding thought, right? You know, it's, it's customary in this type of presentations to offer fixes, right? In good consciousness, I cannot say that I have any one particular fix to offer because you see the problem is very complex. And first of all, I would say that there needs to be an educational campaign to educate the public that, they, that what we have here is too much freedom. And you know, sometimes they say there's a too much, there's what well, too, too much of a good thing. So I will just end on, on a hopeful note uh, that we really need to educate the public and this would be a good first start. Thank you.